actually starts recording. There we go. Excellent. And here we go. All right. Ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, good morning. Happy Monday morning. This is May 11th. I hope you're having a fantastic day so far. I hope you had a great weekend. Hope you had a great Mother's Day. Um, today, what I would like to do with you is I would like to go off of our discussion last time where we talked about simplifying rational expressions by multiplying and dividing. And today, I'd like to talk about how we can simplify rational expressions by adding and subtracting. Okay. As Ganesh was previewing at the beginning, before I started recording, I'm actually kind of sad that I did not get that exchange on the video. Uh, but he mentioned a lot about the fact that you were going to need to have some sort of a common denominator. And that if we have a common denominator, adding and subtracting is, is pretty simple. We kind of just stick the fractions together. But without the common denominator, we need to do a little bit of work to get there. I then asked him what would happen if there were x's involved. And he said, well, probably something a little bit different. But we're going to still have to find that common denominator. And he's absolutely right. That's what we're going to do. So while I'm doing a quick little intro and explaining a couple reminders, just make sure that you give these problems a try. Don't wait for me to do them. Try, try them on your own. See if you can actually recall how to combine fractions like that. Seems easy on the surface level, but it may actually have been a while since you were asked something like that, which is kind of funny. Uh, so in any case, what I want to tell you, yes, make sure that your microphones are muted and your webcams are disabled. Everybody's gotten good at that. Make sure you fill out the attendance form on Google Classroom. Your progress assessment grades should be posted already on Aspen. The answer key was uploaded this morning. Uh, I have to give Steven a shout out. Steven actually messaged me and said there was a little error on the answer key, which there is. For the first problem, I wrote plus one on the answer key when it's supposed to be minus one as the vertical shift. So I'll go ahead and correct that and upload a corrected answer key a little bit later today. But that seemed to be the only mistake. I didn't find any others. Um, but I made sure to do another once over. But still, I appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else that I have to tell you guys? Yes, there is. So after class today, although we normally do have progress assessments after every class that meets on a Monday or whatever day happens to start the week for our white day rotation, uh, this week there will not be one. You're going to get a little break this week, only because I don't think we've learned quite enough information to actually assess you yet. Like there's not th this information on simplifying rational expressions by multiplication and division and addition and subtraction is really kind of background information that will lead into solving equations. Solving equations is definitely where you're going to start to see your progress assessments. Uh, there will be at least two of them on solving equations. But for the simplifying stuff, I'm not going to test you ex uh, specifically on this information. So I guess you do get a little break this week. Uh, as far as graded work goes, I will still be uploading an ungraded practice assignment on Google Classroom that I absolutely expect you to do. The answer key is provided for you. It's excellent practice, like I said, uh, to go through problems like these. And it's important that you understand this concept because it is going to be a big deal when we get into solving equations. So this is really how solving equations works. It's by you know, understanding the concepts like these. And if you if, if this is troublesome, then going right into equations is going to be an issue. So please, please, if you have any questions today, please make sure that you ask, interrupt. I don't care if you unmute and interrupt. It doesn't bother me at all. Don't be shy. If you don't want to do that, then you can type in the chat. That's fine too. Either way, please make sure you let us know. I want to give one more shout out again to Miss Mao and her office hours. Please make sure you stop by if you need them. She's also been providing notes and they've been very detailed and fantastic. So hopefully you've been taking advantage of that resource as well. All right, let's get right into it, shall we? So last time, if you remember, we were multiplying and dividing rational expressions together. When we multiply, we multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. But when we add and subtract, it's slightly different. If I have a problem like this, 2 sevenths plus 1 seventh, what that means is I have 2 out of 7 things, and I have now an additional 1 out of 7 things. So how many things do I have? Picture if you had a pizza that was cut into 7 slices. You had 2 of them, and then you had 1 more of them. So how many did you have that would simplify just to 3 sevenths? We just add the numerator and keep the denominator the same. It's very important that you do not write that 1 2 sevenths plus 1 seventh is 3 out of 14. We don't touch those denominators. If there's 7 slices of pizza and you eat 2, then you eat 1 more. It doesn't mean that there are now 14 slices of pizza. Magically, 7 more just appeared. It's just that there's 2 out of 7 plus 1 out of 7 is 3 out of 7. 
seems simple, it seems basic, but there is a common mistake that students tend to do, especially when we start throwing X's in there, that they start adding denominators. Please make sure you don't do that. Okay, just want to point that out. The next problem here, we have 2 thirds plus 1 seventh. That one's a little trickier. As Ganesh was mentioning before we started recording, we can't quite combine those things together because the fractions, the denominators of the fractions are different. It's almost like you're measuring one in terms of inches and the other in terms of miles. Like how the heck are we supposed to stick those together? They're out of different scales. Well, what we can do is we can convert everything to a least common denominator, often abbreviated as LCD, like the TV. So what's the low and what about what least common denominator what i mean by that is what is the lowest possible number that both three and seven are factors of in other words what's the lowest possible number that three and seven can fit into and the lowest possible number for which that's the case is 21. okay because if you think of the factors of three that's 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21. Think of the factors of 7. That's 7, 14, 21, 28. 21 is the first one where they overlap, so that's your least common denominator. So that means that your goal is to convert both of these denominators to be out of 21. Like, I'd like this to look like this. What do I need to do to this in order to make it look like this? I need to multiply 3 by 7 to get 21. So I need to do the same on the top as well. I'm going to multiply 2 by 7 to get 14. In our second term here, what do I need to multiply 7 by to get 21? That's times 3. So I need to do the same to the numerator. 1 times 3 is 3. And now that the denominators are the same, I can just refer to our first problem here and do 14 out of 21 plus 3 out of 21 is 17 out of 21. That's 14 plus 3. Questions, comments, or concerns about that? Again, seems like you might be like, well, didn't we do this in like fourth grade? Perhaps, but it's important that you understand these concepts and these ideas because this is exactly the same process we're going to do with X's and variables in just a moment. Last one here, we have to find the least common denominator of all three in order to make that work out. Our least common denominator between 2, 8, and 16 is 24. That is the lowest number that is uh, both a factor of 2 and a factor of 8 and also a factor of 6 because, oh, sorry, not a factor of, other way around, a multiple of 2, a multiple of 8, and a multiple of 6. I always equate the least common denominator, this may be a silly comparison, but I always equate it to that children's toy where it's like a cube kind of like this and it has all different shaped holes on the outside of it and you have all these different shaped pegs that go into the holes. You have like a circle and you have a square one and you have a star shaped one, you have like a little moon one and it's your job to be like, oh, the moon peg has to fit into the moon hole and the uh, circle peg has to fit into the circle hole and it's like, that's what the least common denominator is. It's like all of these are your pegs, and the least common denominator has to accommodate all of them. It does 20, is 2 accommodated by 24? Yes. Is 8 accommodated? Yes. Is 6 accommodated? Yes. They can all fit into this value of 24. So, again, it's kind of silly, but I, that's, I, for whatever reason, that's what I think of when I think of least common denominator. So, our goal is to now convert everything to be out of 24. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about when I talk about that toy, right? You, you've played with that before, right? You, you must have. Look it up. Uh, in any case, um, we now want to convert all of these to be out of 24. What do I need to do to the 2 to make it be a 24? I need to multiply by 12, so I need to do the top as well. 1 times 12 is 12. How do I get from 8 to 24? I need to multiply by 3, so I need to do the same to the numerator. 3 times 3 is 9. And how do I get from 6 to 24? I need to multiply by 4, so I do the same to the numerator. 1 times 4 is 4. I now have 12 out of 24 plus 9 out of 24 minus 4 out of 24. The denominators are all the same, so we can really just focus on the numerators. 12 plus 9 is 21 minus 4 is 17 out of 24. Very nice. Okay. Any questions at all about how any of those problems were done? Before we now transition to... What if there's X's and variables involved? Question going once. Question going twice. All right, question sold. Here we go. Let's throw some X's in there then. Let's use some variables, shall we? Here we go. How about something like this? What if I wanted to do 4 over 2X 
plus 3 over 6x squared minus 1 third. Okay? And I wanted to stick all those fractions together and simplify it as best I could. Well, what you'd have to do right off the bat is because all the fractions have different denominators, we need to again find a least common denominator. Here, where all your factors are monomials, in the other word, everything is multiplied and divided. There's no additions and subtractions. What I always recommend is trying to find the least common denominator of the constants first, and then try to find the least common denominator of the variables. So let's start with the constants. I have 2x, 6x squared, and 3. So let's start with my constants of 2, 6, and 3. What's the least common denominator, the lowest number that can accommodate both 2 and 6 and also 3? That's going to be 6, right? Because 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 1 is 6, and 3 times 2 is 6. Now looking at the variables, I, need, I have x, I have x squared, and I have no x's. So what's the, least va what's the lowest value that I need to accommodate all of those pieces? The lowest value I need is x squared. Because notice, if I just put a regular old x, this guy's happy because it would be like, oh, well, I can fit in there, no problem. But this one, it's trying to take an x squared peg and fit it into the x hole. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't work out at all. x squared is too large to fit into just a regular old x. So this guy's like, what the heck? I'm feeling a little left out here. We need to bump up the least common denominator to 6x squared to make everybody happy. And this guy's happy because all he needs is to be able to fit into the 6, so there's no problem there. Does that make sense why the least common denominator is 6x squared? Because I could take something, I could take this and multiply it by something to get this. I could take this and multiply it by something to get this. I could take this and multiply it by something to get that. Speaking of which, that's exactly what we're going to take a look at right now. So your goal is I would now love all of these denominators to be 6x squared. I would love that. So what do I need to do to this denominator to make it be 6x squared? Well, I need to multiply by 3 first because 2 times 3 is 6. And then I need to multiply x by x to make x squared. So I really need to multiply by 3x to get from here to here. So that's what I'm going to do on the top as well. I'm going to take the 4 and multiply it by 3x. You absolutely could do that all in one step and just write 12x, but I'm just showing you for the sake of showing you. What do I need to multiply 6x squared by in order to get 6x squared? Well, nothing, really. I have to multiply by 1. We don't change it at all, so the same thing doesn't change up here. What do I need to multiply 3 by in order to get 6x squared? I need to multiply by 2 to get from 3 to 6, and then multiply by x squared to get from no x's to x squared. So I need to multiply by 2x squared. So I'm going to take the 1 that's already in the numerator and multiply by 2x squared. Does that make sense to everybody? Oh, that's the case. Okay, excellent. Now you just combine everything together. So on the numerator, I have... 4 times 3x is 12x plus 3 uh, minus, let's see, we got 2x squared. And these are all over 6x squared. And now since all our denominators are the same, just like we did up here, we can squish them all together. And I'm going to rewrite this in a familiar order, in decreasing order. And we could write that this is negative 2x squared plus 12x plus 3 all over 6x squared. And that's how you could take all of those things and combine it into a single term. I'm not particularly worried with factoring that at the moment. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you how you do how you implement a least common denominator in order to combine things. Could we then factor that and maybe or maybe use the quadratic formula for actually solving an equation? Absolutely we could. But that's not really the focus right now. I just want to show you how all those terms can combine together. Any questions about that at all? I'm obviously going to show you a couple more examples. All right. How about something like this? What if we have 7 over x plus 1 plus 3 over 2? Just like that. Two terms added together. Well, the reason why I wanted to point this out for you is because we need to, of course, find our least common denominator here. These denominators are clearly different, so we need to find a least common one to put them together. It's very important when you have something like x plus 1 in the denominator. x plus 1 is a singular factor of x plus 1. It's not a factor of x 
and a factor of 1. It is a factor of x plus 1. If you have singular factors like this, the reason we were able to pull these apart over here is because these are all being multiplied together. 2 times x is a factor of 2 and a factor of x. When I have x plus 1, that is a factor of x plus 1. Okay, so it's important that you recognize something like this is really a singular piece. It's not like, it's not two different things. So in order to accommodate everything here, I need a factor of 2 to make this guy happy. And I need a factor of x plus 1 to make this guy happy. Otherwise, if you just put a factor of 2, this one's going to be like, hey, wait a minute, I, I'm left out over here. And if you just put x plus 1, this one's going to be like, wait a minute, what about me? So you have to make sure you accommodate everything. Now that we do that, we can go ahead and establish my goal here. I'd like this denominator to look like that. And I'd like this denominator to look like that. So what do I need to multiply to get from here to here is multiply by 2. I do the same in the top. 7 times 2 is 14. What do I do to get from here to here? I need to multiply by x plus 1. So I'm going to take my 3 in the numerator, multiply by x plus 1. Now that the denominators are the same, I'm going to stick the fractions together. I'm also going to do a little bit of distributing in that numerator as I drew the arrows here. So I'm going to get 14 plus 3x plus 3. Notice that that 3 distributed to the x and distributed to the 1. And now we can combine like terms and just simplify it to be, let's see, it's going to be 3x plus 17. That's 14 plus 3 all over 2 times x plus 1. Okay, And that's how you could simplify and condense that down to be one term. Any questions about that at all? We're obviously going to keep going with some more examples, so don't worry. Don't worry. we still got more in store. Okie doke. Let's step it up a little bit then. Let's step it up a little bit. Ready? How about something like this? Yeah. I have 3 over x minus 2 minus 4 over x plus 4 plus, let's do 1 over x squared plus 2x minus 8. Oh boy, it might seem like we've just gone from 0 to 60 real fast, but don't panic, we can get through it. We can get through it. Okay, we got 3 over x minus 2, minus 4 over x plus 4, plus 1 over x squared plus 2x minus 8. Well, your Algebra 2 instinct should be going crazy right now. It's like a spider sense. It's like, OMG. Look at this right here. This expression right here should scream to you factoring. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and factor that. Before we actually start to find my least common denominator, let's factor and simplify as much as we can. I can rewrite this as 3 over x minus 2 minus 4 over x plus 4 plus 1 over. We're going to break this down into two binomials. We need x and x to multiply to x squared. I need different signs to multiply to a negative at the end. And it looks like to get plus 2 in the middle, I'm going to need plus 4 and minus 2. Kind of coincidentally matching those, which is nice. So now that, I can, now that I've factored that expression down, it's much easier for me to, uh, to identify my least common denominator. So what do I need to make everybody happy? Well, I have an x minus 2 over here, I have an x plus 4 here, and I have an x plus 4 and x minus 2 here. So I need a factor of x minus 2. That makes this happy. I almost put a little check there. And that makes this happy. I also need a factor of x plus 4. Because that makes this guy happy, and that makes this guy happy. So altogether, your least common denominator is x minus 2 times x plus 4. Does that make sense to everybody why that's the case? Because the factor of x minus 2 satisfies this and satisfies this. And the factor of x plus 4 satisfies this and this. Notice you could always ask yourself that question of like, what can I multiply this by in order to get this? I need to multiply by x plus 4. And that's the question we're really going to be asking ourselves very soon anyway. What do I need to multiply this by to get this? x minus 2. What do I need to multiply this by to get this? Is, it's, is nothing. Is 1. So... Let's do exactly that right now. I'd like all my denominators then to look like this. I would like that to look like that. And I'd like that to look like that. 
So what do I need to multiply? I just pretty much said it. What do I need to multiply this by in order to get this? That's x plus 4. So I need to do that on the top as well. I'm going to take the 3 that's already there and multiply it by x plus 4. What do I need to multiply this by to get this? It's the x minus 2. I'm going to take the 4 that's already there, multiply it by x minus 2. What do I need to multiply this by to get this? Nothing. I'm just going to leave it alone. Now that all the denominators are the same, I'm going to go ahead and condense them down to be one fraction. Notice I have a little bit of distributing in the numerator to do as well. We have 3 times x and 3 times 4 is going to be 3x plus 12. Here's something that's very tricky that a lot of students will miss, and it's a very common mistake, that make sure we're distributing the negative 4 here and here, correct? This is minus 4 times x and minus 4 times negative 2. A lot of students forget that right away. They, they definitely leave out that negative sign, or maybe they only do it to the first one and not to the second one. When you have a negative out here, a minus 4, it's, it's read and interpreted exactly like I just said. You can think of it as it's minus 4 times x and minus 4 times negative 2. Okay, please, please, please do not miss that. Some students, it's not necessary to do this, but some students find it helpful to say that if I ever see a minus sign in front of a fraction like this, they often do that to just keep the negative up there with the 4. That's, again, absolutely not necessary. I, I personally don't do that, but it's a little trick that some students have picked up and they find it helpful. So if you find that helpful, just to make sure you don't skip out on those negatives, that's why I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. So going forward from there, I have negative 4 times x is minus 4x. Negative 4 times negative 2 is plus 8. And then I have this additional plus 1. And now we're just going to combine all those like terms as best we can. And this comes out to be, let's see, 3x minus 4x is negative 1x. And 12 plus 8 is 20, plus 1 is 21. All over x minus 2 times x plus 4. And it will always, 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 maybe I shouldn't say always, I'll say 99.9% .9 of the time, it'll be beneficial to keep the fraction in that factored form in the denominator. Don't then re-multiply that out to get this. The reason why is because when it's in factored form, it's easier to, number one, identify the least common denominator, and number two, to identify stuff like vertical asymptotes. We talked about graphing, or to identify uh, something that's going to be called a domain restriction that I will bring up on Wednesday. You'll find out what that's all about. But it's essentially way easier to deal with something that's in factored form than something like this. So just leave it like that. Any questions about that example? We're going to do one more. Okay, last one, and I love this last example, uh, actually. It's a personal favorite of mine. We got x over x plus 3 minus 18 over x squared minus 9. You feel that? You feel that? That's your Algebra 2 instincts. Your Algebra 2 instincts looking right here, x squared minus 9, that's a good old difference of two squares. Always got to be ready for a difference of two squares. We have x over x plus 3. We talked about difference of two squares a couple times now. That's going to now become an x plus 3 and an x minus 3. Remember, x squared, we need x and x. Minus 9, we need plus 3 minus 3 because that combines to the 0x in the middle. You can also think of it as, oh, two square numbers. Bam, we need x and x, 3 and 3. If it's x squared minus 25, x plus 5, x minus 5. x squared minus 64, x plus 8, x minus 8. Bam, should be quick. Now we can identify our least common denominator. I need a factor of x plus 3, because otherwise this guy's going to be sad and that's going to be sad. And I also need a factor of x minus 3 to keep that guy happy as well. Notice if we just had x plus 3, this one's going to be like, hey, well, well, wait a minute here. I have an x minus 3 too. We, can, we can't leave out x minus 3, right? Can't leave out my buddy x minus 3. So that's why we need that least common denominator. I want to convert everything to look like that now. Convert that to look like that. Convert this to look like this. Right? We need all those denominators to match up. So what do I need to multiply this by in order to make it look like this? Well, I need to multiply it by x minus 3. So I'm going to take the x that's already there and multiply by x minus 3 in the numerator. What do I need to multiply this by in order to get this? Nothing. It already looks like that. So we'll just leave it alone really multiply it by 1. Okay. Notice I can distribute over here. I'm going to get 
x squared minus 3x minus 18. And squishing the fractions together, that's all over x plus 3 times x minus 3. Does that make sense how we did that? One really cool thing that you could actually do in this problem is you could even go one step beyond. And you could say, ooh, x squared minus 3x minus 18, hmm, that looks like a factorable something or other to me. And absolutely it is. I can go ahead and actually factor down x squared minus 3x minus 18 in the numerator now to be x plus 3 times x minus 6 all over x plus 3 times x minus 3. And now you can think to yourself, ooh, wait a minute, one more thing I could do, x plus 3 and x plus 3 goes away, just like we saw with those graphing problems when they created holes in the graph. And I can simplify this expression all the way down now to x minus 6 over x minus 3. Okay? And that's that. I like that one because it's actually a little extra step that you can do right at the end there. Any questions, comments, or concerns about that at all? Going once. Going twice. Alrighty, guys. Uh, well, one thing I just want to remind you is, again, there is not a graded assessment uh, this week, so you do get about a, a little week off, which is nice, but not a week off from work to do in Algebra 2. There will still be some practice problems on Classrooms that I definitely expect that you give, a tr give your best effort towards. The answer key is also posted there, or will be, it, just in a couple moments. So make sure that you try those problems, check the answers, see to make sure that you did them right. Um, again, no graded assessment this week. That will come next week. Next class, we are going to start solving rational equations. That we're going to spend a good amount of time on, so make sure that you're you know, ready for that and up to speed on it. These skills, by the way, in case you're wondering, well, why did we spend two days on one on multiplying and dividing, one on adding and subtracting if there's not going to be any sort of assessment? Number one, it's incredibly useful background knowledge to, to deal with solving equations. When we deal with equations, we're going to see all these concepts like least common denominator and uh, combining fraction divided by a fraction. We're going to see all that stuff show up. So it's really important that you learn how to do that. When I started teaching Algebra 2, I didn't take extra time to explain how to combine rational expressions like that. I just kind of jumped right into rational equations, and a lot of students found it to be overwhelming. So that's why I decided to kind of spread out that explanation a little bit, that background information for you. That's reason number one. And reason number two is that now that I'm teaching pre-calculus this year, we use this stuff all the time. We use this uh, just about every type of problem in pre-calculus. We use these ideas of least common denominator and the ideas we talked about last class of multiplying and dividing things together, like a fraction divided by a fraction. shows up literally all the time. Uh, so it's very important that you understand those skills going forward. All right. So. In any case, thank you so much for your attention and focus today. I hope you have a great rest of your Monday. I will see you on, when do we see each other again? Wednesday. I'll see you on Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks again. Bye, everyone. Sean, you have a great day as well.